before moving further let's just spend a minute understanding the different kinds of data that we encounter so the here we have a table where we have given the student name and against each student we have two things the first is their fruit preference the preference of the kind of food that they uh, fruit that they really like and their height although the data might seem similar the kind of data that we have here the two kinds of data that we have here are indeed quite quite different the first one the fruit preference can be only one of three types either it can be apple or orange or banana so it can be one of those three types only such data which can be classified into one of few types is known as categorical data the second data is not only numeric it is numeric because it is made up of numbers but it is also continuous what does it mean it means that the heights of students it, it is not that the height could only be three feet or it could only be four feet we can have any number of heights between three and four feet therefore this height data is actually continuous so those are the two main kinds of data that we really encounter when we are using statistics when we are doing data handling one is categorical data such as the fruit preference color choice of clothes other is the uh, continuous data continuous data is numeric for example it could be height it could be weight things which take which can take any number of values with that understanding with that basic understanding on the types of data let's just understand how we can apply a very very common a very very important statistic on these these two kinds of data the statistics is known as frequency frequency as the name itself suggests counts the number of occurrences of a given type of value in in our data so for example if i were to count the number of occurrences of apple in fruit preference so how many students actually like apple if i were to count that that would be the frequency of apple very very simple similarly i can also count the frequency of orange banana so on and so forth in case of continuous data the counting is done little differently and we'll see that in a second but let's just first focus on the categorical data and how do we count the frequency of categorical data systematically okay um, simply you can count the value in the table and that would be a count as well right so i can count from here that the number of students who like apple is two but that wouldn't be a systematic method that wouldn't be a very mathematical method so we'll just count the the apples the 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 fruit preference data will count the frequency of food preferences using a systematic method the first step is to actually devise another table in that table we have written each of these categories we'll count how many times each of these categories apple orange and banana occurs in our student table so to do that we start from the first row of our student table and if the apple appears if, if the fruit which appears there in the first row we increase the count of that fruit by one so in the first row there was apple so we increase the count of apple by one now we move on to the next row it was orange so we increase the count of orange by one very very natural very very simple so this is how we, we can simply and systematically count the number of occurrences of each of these fruit preferences so in the next two rows we had banana so the count of banana increased by two then subsequently we have orange banana and then so on and so forth so in this way we have accounted for all the students in the student table and we have counted their fruit preferences in our second table the thing to note here is that there is a slight difference between the kind of data which is available in the first table the student table and the fruit preference or the second table the frequency table there is a there is a difference between the kind of data which is available here from this data from the frequency data we can answer questions such as which is the most preferred fruit okay you will say it's banana what is the most least preferred fruit that would be apple okay so those are the kinds of questions which are easily answered using this table whereas if we want to find out answers to questions such as who likes apple who likes banana that information is kind of missing from here we don't have that information for that we will have to go back to the second table so understand the difference that we are counting we are able to count the frequency in the second table but we are losing something in in turn so now with the, with this information we have counted we have counted for the frequency of each of the fruit preferences in real life when we are doing maths drawing this symbol although these apples and bananas they look very beautiful <laughs> so you might be tempted to put those in it is very hard to draw it in your examination copies so typically mathematicians don't do that instead of using the actual symbols of apple and oranges and bananas what they do is that they replace them by simple lines 
So instead of using the symbols themselves, the fruits themselves, I replace them with lines here. These lines, these vertical lines are known as tally marks. So we have these markings, markings and now we only have to count these markings instead of counting the fruits. Another thing to understand is that as soon as I have five of these tally marks, for example, for banana, I have five tally marks. Instead of putting the fifth tally mark towards the end, I would move the tally mark and cross the other four tally marks that I already have. So I move this tally mark and put and put it as a cross. So that is the notation of tally marks. It is very, very important to understand that. Now that we have these tally marks, it is very, very simple to do the counting. So how many students actually liked apple? Two, one, two. How many liked orange and how many liked banana? We can similarly count those. Notice that this group of four tally marks with a cross, we can simply look at the group and say that it is five. So our counting becomes easier when we have grouped our tally marks in this way. Now we have understood how to do the tally marks, how to count the frequency for a categorical variable, which was fruit preference in our example. Similarly, we can also count, we can do the counting we can do the frequency counting for even for continuous variable. For example, the height given here. How would we do that? So first, we don't really have any kind of ready-made categories for the height variable because it was continuous. So there is no, it can take any of the possible values. So there is no ready-made uh, categories there. So we artificially categorize the height. How do we do that? We create ranges. These are known as class intervals. Okay, these intervals, these ranges, we have artificially created according to our own choice. And now we can classify the height into one of these four ranges. Process of doing the classification is actually very similar to what we did for the categorical variable. We'll start from the first row and we'll increment the count of the corresponding height range, right? So the first row is actually 3.1. So we'll increment the count of this range 3.0 to 3.9 right here. The second variable, the second row has 3.2. Again, we'll increment the count right here. Similarly, we'll go on for the third row, the fourth row and the fifth row. One of the things that you have to notice is that when we are creating this range, we need to make sure that the ranges do not really overlap. If there is an overlap in the range, for example, if 4.0 to 4.9, instead of that, I had 4.2. 0 to 5 and here also I started with 5 then I would have trouble as to where should I put this 5. This 5 could be counted here or here. So avoid that confusion when we are creating these class intervals we do not overlap them and it is very important to do that. When you are, when you are divide, dividing this entire height into ranges it is very important that you don't overlap. So we are continuing the process of counting each time we encounter a new height we classify into one of these four class intervals and it is very simple we can see where the class interval is and we put it right there now that we have classified all the class intervals uh, all the heights into various class intervals we can now count them but before we do that our tally marks have a little bit of problem what is the problem here we have five tally marks okay these are 3.0 to 3.9 there were five students with the height in this range 3.0 to 3.9 but the five, we don't write like this. It is against our convention. So we take the fifth bar and we mark it as a cross across all previous four bars. So with that, we have done our tally marks for the height as well. We were able to categorize artificially, mind you, our height as well. And now we have, we can count our tally marks and understand how many students fall in which of these ranges. Notice that this data is actually very important. Remember in the in the previous class in the in the very very beginning we discussed that I wanted if I wanted to create furniture for my class then I would like to understand where most of the students actually fall in which height range most most of the students actually fall so that I can design my furniture accordingly. From this data we have that we know that most of the students fall in the range of 3.0 to 3.9 and therefore if I were to design the height of my tables and chairs I would likely design it, design it according to this height. So this data, this data where we have divided the students into various class intervals is very very important. It is very very useful. It is providing us some additional information which was not available in the first table, not readily available in the first table. Now that we have created, we have counted the students, we have uh, in both both for their uh, fruit preference and the height, both for a discrete, uh, for a categorical as well as for a continuous variable. Let's understand how we can draw graphs for each of those variables. 
If we have a categorical variable, the simplest and the easiest kind of graph or the chart we can draw to depict that variable is known as a bar chart. Don't worry, we'll study bar chart, we'll look at bar chart in great detail, we'll understand how to create that. Here it is just given for a reference for comparison. So if we have a categorical variable, the kind of graph that I would get is known as a bar graph. Okay, so this is the bar graph that I have drawn for that variable. Bar graph actually is very simple. On the x-axis, this horizontal axis is known as x-axis. The vertical axis is known as y-axis. Axis is just the name of the lines that we have here. Okay, they are imaginary lines here for which we have given them two names. On the x-axis, on this horizontal axis, I have put in all my categories. Very, very simple, right? So there are three categories, apple, banana and orange. And I have marked those categories right here. On the y-axis, I have given the student number of students which prefer a particular category of fruit. So on the y-axis, I have listed this. On the y-axis, I simply depict the number of students. So my students can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So this is just number of students. Against each of those, these category, categorical variable, for example, against apple, I would draw a bar. Okay, and the height of the bar is simply the number of students which prefer that particular fruit. So from the table, I can read that the number of students is 2 and the height of my first bar would actually be 2. From the table, I'll read that number of students which prefer orange is 3 and the height of my orange bar would actually be 3. Similarly, for banana, the height would be 5 and indeed it is 5. So with that, with this simple graph can depict all the information given in this table in a very nice, in a very nice pictorial way. And from here also, we can quickly read that most of the students like banana. So the graph would make our reading job little easier to, And also it makes our statistic look little more interesting. So this was the case with categorical variable. This is how we will depict the uh, graph of a categorical variable. One of the optimizations that we can do in this graph is that we, to make it look more nicer, we will just order the our categorical variables according to their height. So I, I start with decreasing height, uh, either I can have increasing height or I can have decreasing height and that would just make it look nicer. There is per se, there is no nothing wrong with either of those graphs. Now let's move on to how we would actually do the same thing. How would we create a graph for a uh, continuous variable. So this was a continuous variable and the kind of graph that the simplest graph that we can draw to depict the frequency of a continuous variable. Okay, so mind you, these are we are depicting frequency in these graphs. Okay, both of these graphs, we are depicting the frequencies, the kind of graph that we will use to depict the frequency of continuous. So this is continuous variable, we know that. Continuous variable, the kind of graph that we would use is known as a histogram. Okay, the two graphs might look actually very same in the histogram. Also, we have the same thing. We have our height, which is our various ranges that we have on the x axis. So this is where various ranges similar to the categories we had here. These are our various ranges we have on the x axis and on the y axis. Again, we have the number of students which fall in that particular range. So for example, in the range of 2.0 to 2.9 in this range, the number of students was actually one. And we have depicted that right here in the graph. Similarly, in the second range, the number of students is 5 and that is what we have depicted. The third is 3 and that is what we have depicted right here. And in the fourth range, the number of students is again 1 and that is what we have depicted here. Remember, for the fourth range, the value that we had was a single value 5.0. And indeed at that point, we said that instead of classifying it here, we would classify 5.0 here because we, we had kept our ranges disjoint. 5.0 would fall into this fourth range and not in this range, right? At the time when we were classifying, we clarified that. So 5.0 actually fell here and not here. Now, when we are drawing the histogram, one of the things that you would notice is that there is no distinction between 2.9 and 3. That is the most important difference between a bar graph and a histogram. A histogram because this is, it is depicting a continuous variable at the bottom on the x-axis I have continuous variable that continuity is depicted by not separating the two bars and that is very very important the bars of my histogram they are attached to each other they share a common edge so both of these bars share the common edge of three both of these bars 
they share the common edge of 5 but it is understood that the value of 5.0 was accounted in this bar 5 to 6 range and not in this range and that is clear by the way I have classified my data. So that is the main difference between the histogram and the bar graph. Histogram depicts a continuous variable. On the x-axis we don't have categories, we have continuous variable and because it has continuous variable, I do not keep my different bars disjoint. So if you understand that, you have understood the two concepts very very nicely, bar graph and histogram, both are very similar, both depict the frequency of occurrence, one of categorical variables and the second one of continuous variable. The thing to note here is that in case of histogram, our bars are not disjoint. Whereas in case of bar graph, these bars have to be disjoint. We cannot join them together. That is the most important thing. Of course, the histograms have some other properties also. The areas of these bars are very, very special, which we will study in another class.